Brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Burling and Josh Jr. I was telling the boys about Dave Latelli yesterday and about the walk-on music, and so they wanted their own walk-on music, so that's the best that we could possibly do. So is that all right? Thank you. Love it. Uh, anyway, it's so cool to have you guys here uh, for the last session of the Connections Conference, which, as you know, has been going for the last uh, couple of days. So th these two blokes here, they're pretty impressive. Um, not only in their sporting exploits, but also uh, when looking at conservation uh, off the boat as well. Let's start with Pete, an Olympic gold medalist and reigning America's Cup champion, and Josh, a 2019 Finn Gold Cup winner and America's Cup champion as well. I mean, seriously, the list could just go on and on and on for both these guys, but we don't have that much time. Uh, both Peter and Josh are now part of the NZ Sail GP team, which began its career in 2021. Um, and the Kiwis race with purpose, supporting its Race for the Future charity partner, Live Ocean. Every time I see that word, I think live, live, live ocean, the marine right. conservation organisation founded by Pete Burling and Blair Chuk. Um, but it is an absolute pleasure, like I said earlier, to have these two guys uh, join us this afternoon. So I guess I, the way that this session is expected to run is that it'll go Josh and then Pete, but Pete's just told me that he's just going to talk over the top of Josh, so we'll just see how this, <laughs> uh, we'll see how this session off. goes. And also, I think, we, I don't know if we've got runners for this afternoon. Yep, we've got a couple of mics out in the audience, so please, if you have any questions, <laughs> just throw them um, at any time. I'm more than happy to interrupt. Um, but I guess the, the first thing I'll do is starting by uh, throwing a question to the both of you and talking about your passion for sailing and when that actually began. Yeah, well, I guess, um, you know, I grew up in Wellington at the West Bay Boating Club and... Can, can uh, you hear Josh? <coughs> check, check. Oh, yeah. Yep. Might need to bring a bit closer. Can you hear me? Yeah, nice. Um, grew up at West Bay Boating Club and, you know, my parents sailed, so I grew up sailing there and then just eventually got more and more um, competitive and, and just loved being on the water and being on the water with friends and enjoying the ocean but also racing. So um, I've been lucky enough that that's just continued for the rest of my life so far and I'm just really enjoying the journey at the moment. Mm -hmm. Pete? Yeah, well, I'm pretty, pretty similar to Josh, to be fair. I grew up down in, in Tauranga, so... Um, yeah, pretty cool a little coastal town. You know, my parents weren't particularly into sailing, but you know, I thought it'd be a really cool school for me to have as a young fella. And you know, I think I just loved it from an early age that that freedom of you know, being out on the water, being able to make your own decisions, and you know, really having to, I suppose, be responsible for for your own destiny in a lot of ways. And no, it's pretty um, a pretty amazing sport in a lot of ways. You know, as a a young person to be able to you know have have those opportunities, and I've uh, just. Um, yeah, been enjoying the, the ride ever since. Uh, this is probably not a, a normal question and one that athletes would balk <coughs> at, uh, I think, but what do you think makes you so good? <laughs> like in terms of whether it's a mindset, whether it, you know, you can, whether you can look back at the past and see something from that, you know, what is it? Because you guys are bloody good, and so let's celebrate that in the first <laughs> instance. But why? Well, I think it's always a hard one to answer. Yeah. It's probably the same for you. Why are you so good at communicating with people? We, well, we struggle a little bit. But, uh, but, you know. Yeah, um, yeah for myself, we, you know, where I really like to, uh, I suppose, employ this ethos of you, there's always so much to learn and, you know, you always, no matter how good your performance is in, you know, our sport, that no one makes all the correct decisions and you play with an environment where there are just millions of variables, millions of little details that, that you can do better and, um, you know, e even if you have your, your best ever event, you could go back and pick it, pick it apart and, um, you know, try and be open to taking that feedback and learning. And, you know, more recently it's kind of been with bigger and bigger teams, so it's been really cool to try and create those environments where you can, you know, have honest and open, frank conversations with each other and push each, each other really hard and, you know, also try and figure out how to get the best out of one another in those tricky situations when the pressure really does come on. We, I just want to... Um stay with that bit for a moment. So when you have those uh, upfront, <coughs> honest, probably confronting conversations at time, how have you as an athlete worked through that process? Because I imagine potentially the first few times it was done to you, you went, well, yep, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we all know everyone in 
you know, our environment has the same goal at the end of the day. You know, we're all there to, to try and get the best out of uh, one another and to you know, also try and do the best for the team or you know, whatever endeavour you're, you're trying to achieve at, at that stage. So you know, when someone's giving you that honest and open feedback, you can genuinely know that they've got your best interest at heart when they are doing that. So you know, at times it doesn't feel the best, but you know, and in times from the outside it does look quite confrontational, like, like you've said, but you definitely need that certain level of confrontation. You know, if you're kind of just sitting back on your laurels and everything's plain sailing, kind of excuse the pun, um, you're, you're probably definitely not pushing yourself hard enough. Yeah. Josh? Go back to the first original question, why are you so good? Why are we, so, oh, I don't know, I think, um, you know, obviously we enjoy, enjoy being out there, so that's, that's half the, you know, the challenge, is just getting out there and doing it. So, you know, on top of that, we, we all work incredibly hard and, and we train hard and we, and we love to learn and improve on things, like Pete said, to continue improving and to learn from our position and to work with the friends or our training partners around us to get better and better. We're um, talking a little bit about your careers um, as sailors, but we're also going to be talking about the environment, we're going to be talking about conservation and sustainability. But I just wonder, and going back again to the beginning, was there a moment, was there something you saw, was it something that you experienced that you kind of went, you know, I want to be talking more about this space, and I know you're going to be talking a lot about sustainability, Josh, so we'll start there. <coughs> Is there a point that you can remember where you went, yeah, we're, these are important conversations to be had? Yeah, I think for me it's a, it's a growing thing, so I'm learning as we go forward, especially with Pete and the live ocean crowd, that we're, you know, we're learning more and more about the ocean and the importance of it um, to, the, to the planet, really. Um, you know, Team New Zealand's doing some really great initiatives around some stuff, and, and you know, I love being on the ocean and you see the effects and stuff, so you know, it's just a, it's, for me, it's a bit of a learning journey and just continuing to improve and make better and better decisions as I go forward. When you, when you talk about what you see, the effects, we had to Ian Taylor, he showed us a <laughs> shitload of plastics in the ocean. What are you seeing when you're out on the ocean that obviously many of us don't see apart from a picture? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like if you do a bit of travelling and you go to some of the beaches around the world, there is an awful lot of plastic around but I mean there's some stuff around the um, you know that the boys are doing around the the fishing practices and and trying to um, you know stop seabirds and stuff getting getting caught in long lines and stuff so there's just a there's a lot of little things that just need to keep improving to make a good change mm -hmm. but Pete can help us yeah, answer a lot more of those questions. Yeah well uh, obviously the first one for me was where there's a, a tipping point and like personally there, there wasn't one moment but I'd say it's a built up progression of different things and I think everyone can you know reflect on this in their own personal way but you know the probably the first thing for me is you know I love being from New Zealand I love the environment we have here where you can go and enjoy nature and you can go to a beach and enjoy swimming at it um, you know you yeah there's some in Auckland where you get told not to swim there at certain times because there's sewage but like to be honest it's not that bad compared to so many places we go to in the world and then you know probably the first one I'll talk about would be when we were in Rio me and Josh were actually there together in 2016 you know competing for the the Olympics and we're looking at the next slide where Josh is sailing a fin <laughs> might not have been in Rio might not have um, but yeah the, the water there was so bad and you know I'm not sure if any of you've been there but it's the most beautiful topography you know white sand beaches inside a harbour and then pretty much the whole sewerage of that city goes into that bay, just raw sewerage the whole time. And like, you didn't want to get in the water, like you didn't want to taste what was on your lips <laughs> after you got sprayed. Um, and it was just, you know, to put it politely, not the nicest environment. You, you'd literally come off the water and, and have a shower and your full gear to, to try and make sure you didn't get any um, stomach problems. And then, yeah, secondary for me was Actually, when I sailed around the world and kind of seeing how connected everything is, you know, when, when I did the ocean race and, you know, you sail from, you know, somewhere like Hong Kong, which is, you know, incredibly built up down to, to here and, you know, pretty slow boat. I mean, we were going not in a straight line most of the time because we had got diverted around a typhoon. But, um, yeah, it took us about, you know, three weeks or something. So you kind of, you know, get this sense of how interconnected everything is and, yeah, before I race in the ocean race, I'd only ever flown places and it 
to me, when you fly, you really feel like you've been teleported to a whole different environment. You know, you get on a plane, you go to sleep, you get off the plane, it's different temperature, you know, it's, it's a completely different outlook, and, but you don't think it's connected at all, where that, that ocean race really, to me, gave me that sense of connectivity around the world and, you know, how important the oceans are. Um, you know, when you're talking about you know, what you see out there, for me, the scary thing is what we don't see. Um, you know, I talk to, you know, some of our teammates, you know, people like Daltz and Shub and Trey, like people that have sailed around the world, well, as little as 20 years ago, and, you know, how many whales they saw, how many seabirds, how many dolphins, you know, how many schools of fish, and, you know, I sailed around the world, we spent whatever, 160 days on the water, and you could count the number of whales you saw on one hand, um, you only saw a few sharks, so, yeah, and the more I've kind of come along this journey, the more you're, you know, really don't feel like you have to the end of your career to try and do something. So, no, it's definitely something that, you know, all of us are incredibly passionate about trying to look after our playing field and, you know, trying to do our part and, you know, really using that, that power of sport to, to do more than, than just the normal things. Yeah, I guess you've been confronted by it all the time, right, and the sport that you do. I'm really sorry because I've been bouncing all around the place. <laughs> Um, and I know we've kind of got a, a, a way in which we're supposed to conduct this interview, so m my apologies. So we'll go back. Can we go back to that video that was there before and go back to 2019 Melbourne Fin Cup uh, where Josh won gold? <laughs> For me, it's bloody awesome. I've never won a world championship or even medal, so for me, it's my first medal and my first one, so I'm stoked. And, and you know, there's been a lot of successful sailors in the Fin down in the past and, and to be one of those is a really honour. Kinda did a really good job at the start and the first beat and he sort of got away on me. I was a bit worried that I was in trouble of losing the whole regatta but I managed to hold it together and uh, get the result I needed so absolutely over the moon. Yeah I mean for me it's been a bloody outstanding week. I seem to have put together pretty consistent results and, and then seem to be near the front and, and took a bit of pressure off. It's a bit nerve wracking. I've never been leading for championships before, especially for so many days. So, yeah, we certainly felt the pressure, but just bloody stoked to come away with it, really. You don't really like watching yourself on no. it. <laughs> talk, talk to us about the significance of that particular win. Yeah, like, like you heard, that was pretty special for me. It was the first time I'd won a World Championships. and. To be fair, it was the first time New Zealand had won a Finn Gold Cup in 70 odd years, so it was a pretty special moment for me and, and it sort of justified what my, um, my training partner and I were sort of doing and he went on to win the next world, so um, it was a pretty special time for us to show that what we were doing was, was working really well. If you were able to look back over your career so far in terms of highlights, I know this is a kind of a question, highlights though, is there, is there something that actually sits out there, it might not even be a win, I don't know. Yeah, I think you're right, like the win, like I was thinking about this before I came down, you know, like the America's, the two America's Cups, Pete and I have won, and a few other things, the world champs and stuff are, are incredibly special moments, but they're quite short, so, you know, for me, the whole journey has been pretty incredible, the growth as I've gone along and joining bigger and bigger teams and, and learning more and more as a person is the part that I really, really enjoy. Mm. Can we jump to that sustainability space again and talk about what Team New Zealand is doing at the moment and the leverage and legacy programs? Yeah, it's very special boats, isn't it? Um, and also about the recycling of those support boats from the last America's Cup. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit more on what Team New Zealand's up to in that space. Yeah, I think we were lucky enough to work with um, Lotto and the Coast Guard and we managed to get 26 of these boats that um, they ended up laying all our marks for the America's Cup and patrolling the course and stuff. I um, mean, as, as part of that, we um, managed to, you know, give them back to the Coast Guard and, and refurbish them for their purpose. And, and they've gone up and down the country. And the Coast Guard's so important for the boating industry for us. I mean, they're, they're basically search and rescue and education. So for them to have a whole lot of new equipment's really great. And, and similar thing with the sea cleaners here. They, we managed to get six new boats for them and, and they are what they say they are, the sea cleaners. They've picked up over 200,000 bags worth of rubbish out of the Auckland Harbour and out of the mangroves and um, you know their big thing is educating to try and stop the, the rubbish getting there in the first place but with those extra boats they're starting to expand around New Zealand so yeah, trying to do a little bit. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, well, I think the seat cleaners are a really cool thing they do is actually they, they kind of start at the end product and then wrap it right back to the, the source and, you know, really trying to educate people at a young age to, to stop uh, consuming uh, in, in, in that way. So it's a really cool um, round, round product. Can we talk about Chase Zero? Because <coughs> um, this is another project that's happening with Team New Zealand in the next America's Cup, as I understand it. Hydrogen-powered foiling speedboats. Yeah. Hell? Well, I mean, you know, sailing a, is a clean sport. You can go around a race course. You use just your uh, human body in a boat to, you know, in, in this case, we use grinders or cyclists to power the boat to get around the course. But in saying that, we need chase boats who follow us and, and people with computers and all the, you know, sails and stuff that go with it. So, you know, we thought as a team, how can we do this better? How can it be done? And we came up with the concept of a foiling hydrogen chase boat. And... Um, you know, a lot of people said it couldn't be done, it's too hard, you're three or four years away from doing it, but sort of our team put their heads together and, and launched this within um, nine months or so. Um, yeah, it's, it's super cool, like it goes, it can keep up with our boat, so it can go close to 100 kilometres an hour, it can, um, it foils so you can have a cup of tea on it instead of bouncing all over the place. Um, so it's pretty cool, but um, you know, there's still a development phase and there's a bit of a future in this, eh, Pistol, where it could end up. Yeah, well, I think it's incredibly exciting. You know, as Team New Zealand, we really are a development team, and to be able to get a prototype together so quickly like this to really show you know where things can go. Um, you know, you know, obviously, you know, right now it's not economically viable at a mainstream level yet, but it's kind of you know someone's got to make that first step to to progressing our, our sport, and you know you can see how quickly you know the way we drive on the roads is changing um, to more sustainable ventures you know so we're just trying to keep the boating industry up with that and you know it's been an amazing um, initiative and in actually having it as part of the rules of of competing in the next america's cup that you to have a boat in the the racing area it has to be you know powered by a sustainable source so it's um yeah been i suppose both both sides of the coin for, for team new zealand on this one where you're, you're trying to show that it can be achieved but then also kind of enforcing it by rules what is brilliant, uh, and can I say about time, is that there's going to be a Women's America's Cup in the next cycle. But if we talk about the boats, because I know that you guys, well, they will be sailing the AC40s, which you guys have uh, already had a bit of a tutu around with. Um, so talk to me about those boats. Yeah, I mean, firstly, super exciting to have the Women's America's Cup coming. Um, these boats are what they're going to be racing, is the AC40. And um, Pete and I have been commissioning it over the last few weeks, and it's certainly a pretty exciting boat. It's based on what we raced in the last America's Cup. Um, you know, it's uh, incredibly fast and lively and it will bite you pretty hard <laughs> at times. Um, you know, in, the, in our build up for the America's Cup, we're going to be using this boat to test all our new foils on, to test the control systems, to build new sails, use it as a platform to develop as we, as we move forward and design our boats. And then, you know, hopefully come 2024, we'll defend the America's Cup and hopefully our New Zealand women's team will win the Women's America's Cup. It'll be amazing. When you talk about bites you really hard, what do you mean? What? When you said bites you really hard, what do you mean? Boats are the boats are really hard to Oh, sail. okay, what? sorry. <laughs> I was going Is completely that what I mean? different. Oh, right. uh, yeah, train of thought <laughs> on that question. Let's move on to the next one, shall we? Um, the move or the collaboration between Emirates Team New Zealand and uh, Yachting New Zealand as well. And this is engaging school students, right? And there's a program that's called Runa, but within that, there's obviously going to be a, a number of modules, but one in particular is the Koko Kaha. I wonder yeah. if you can expand a bit on that, Josh. Yeah, the Koko Kaha program is, is pretty cool. It's a module within schools and it's, um, it's all about being powered by the wind, so sort of creating sustainable you know, solutions and harnessing the wind to do that. I guess at Team New Zealand that's pretty much what we do. We find solutions to race a boat powered by the wind as fast as we can and, um, you know, at the, at the peak of Team New Zealand we employ 150 people to try and solve that problem um, and we go through a process where you design and refine and test and design again until you get a solution that you're happy with. And, um, you know, that's a similar philosophy as what the teachers are trying to teach within these schools, within the Koko Kaha program. So uh, we're helping out with a few little bits and pieces and content to fit within that. That's pretty cool. 
I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if you can answer this question, but do you know what the feedback's been from the kids? Do you know the, I, what the engagement's been like? Yeah, I think it's in a lot of schools now. I don't know all the details, but um, I don't know. For me, I couldn't imagine it being any, you know, you get to go and build stuff and test stuff within the wind is pretty awesome. <laughs> so I think it's a pretty cool, pretty cool project to be able to do. The uh, last project that I want to talk about with you, Josh, is the Moana Mana project. And I know that a number of you uh, were in the room with uh, Yachting uh, NZ, uh, who would have gone over this program, but a number of you wouldn't have heard about it. So I wonder if you can just talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, I guess I think this is a new module along the same lines as the Koko Kaha program. Um, it's actually starting at my home club in Wursa Bay, which is where I grew up. Um, and, you know, I spent, like I was saying, before, spent my whole life there and playing in the rock pools and enjoying myself. And um, we, at our club, we ended up um, needing to rebuild because the club was getting pretty old and stuff. So we managed to rebuild the club. And as part of that, um, in this Moana project, the, some of the local schools have gotten involved. And even my old high school, like Wellington High School, created the um, sort of like this habitat for the penguins and, and managed to get the council to build these penguin hotels within the rock walls around. And, and so I think the Moana project within schools around Wellington is to continue to develop that little marine reserve around our yacht club as sort of a starting point and to, you know, build like power nurseries and, and some young kids start playing with the anemone gardens and design what that might look like. And then going forward, you might, I think the plan is to build that more into other clubs around New Zealand and with their local schools creating these little blue belts everywhere around the country that hopefully form one big one. But I think Pete's, Pete's all over the <laughs> space and I think he'd tell you that you know the, the key to a healthy planet is a healthy ocean and a lot of that's happening under the water and stuff so you could, might be able to throw a few stats at us because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not as good as you. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, I'll spend a few hours talking about this stuff but yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible initiative. Um, and yeah, like Josh said, you know, the ocean does so, so much for us as an uh, environment. And, you know, in New Zealand, not many people know that 90% of our area um, a, as a nation is actually ocean. Um, so only, you know, 6% is, is land. You know, of that in a marine protected area is 0.4%. So, you know, there is a huge contrast between the way we look after the ocean space um, to the land. And, you know, the, one of the really exciting things about this program for me is, you know, really educating people of, of that importance, you know, educating them about, you know, you know how important some of the sea creatures are. Um, you know, we have some amazing um, national birds on land that, that we look after incredibly well, but, you know, to try and uh, build that, I suppose, awareness of uh, the broader ecosystem we have as, as a nation. Do you go in and talk in schools? I mean, I know you're a busy guy. <laughs> I struggle a little bit for free time, to be honest. <laughs> you're, um, yeah. I just wonder. I think you're lucky uh, Josh has a, a family member in the crowd who's um, you know, made sure we're, we're here today. <laughs> um, but, yeah, you know, it's um, every time I get the opportunity, I, I really love to, to talk um, about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think everyone, um, you can probably tell how passionate I am about it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. as well and I just wonder with you know with kids and obviously like you say you are busy but you know kids pick up on that passion too yeah. and that's the next generation that um, you know are going to take this work that you're talking about forward anyway let's go back to you as an athlete let's go back to Rio 2016 gold in the 49er class Old mate uh, Blair Chuk. I mean, let's not forget there was a silver before that, right? In 2012, 
But does that seem like a blur? Does that seem like a <laughs> lifetime ago, 2016? Yeah, well, it's definitely been a pretty busy time yeah. since then. Uh, can we talk about an ocean race <laughs> to America's Cups? Um, you know, the Tokyo Olympics. There's been a whole lot of stuff that's gone on in the last few years. Yeah, well, I think for, for people that know me, you know, I really enjoy to be busy. And, you know, I think, yeah, uh, you know, whenever you talk to athletes, uh, it's always you're very hard to say no to an opportunity as well. So, you know, I've definitely tried to take on every opportunity that I could possibly fit into the the calendar and no, it's just been a, a pretty amazing journey you know since that time obviously um, you've had all the, the competitions you've uh, talked about but you know also founded a SAIL GP team and and started a marine conservation charity so it's been um, yeah a pretty busy time but you know something that you know I've just you know loved every minute of it and you now it's amazing to have you know great friends and um, you know, support network around us that, that really allows us to, to follow these, you know, ventures and you know, you've had some you know, pretty amazing speakers in the, already today, I think, that, um, you know, but, you know, for myself, I, I really love just hearing other people's stories and, you know, really trying to feed off other people's energy in, in a lot of ways as well. In terms of, and I, and I threw this question at Josh, in terms of highlights, has there been anything in your career, and again, it might not be a win, I don't know. Um, that has been a special time, a special moment for you? Yeah, well, the one you just watched was pretty special. Um, uh, we actually won by the largest ever margin in the Olympic sailing in that event, which was uh, pretty incredible. But, you know, that probably also, um, you know, I told that story about, about Rio earlier. We uh, uh not really in the, the nicest environment, um, so to say. So, no, it's been... Yeah, it's, it's so hard to pick between them. Yeah, it's been yeah. some some amazing times, and they're all special for different reasons. You know, even you look at say the the Muta America's Cup campaign, where you know we really were the underdogs, and you know we didn't make life particularly easy for ourselves with that that capsize uh, early on in the piece. Um, but yeah, it's had some pretty amazing memories over over my career so far. And, and a lot of those memories you've shared with Blair Chuk. And I talked about you and asking you about. What makes you so good? What makes the pair of you good together? <laughs> Is it oh, the robust conversations? Question. Um, yeah. <laughs> they complement each other well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're both quite different people, um, to be honest, but I think we're both really good friends. And, you know, was, there's quite a, a t I suppose, a tight group in New Zealand sailing where you know, we've been on so many of these journeys together, um, you know, with the likes of you know, Josh and, and Andy as well. Um, you know, obviously not sailing together for those two, but um, yeah, definitely at a lot of the same events. And you know, I think it's just been a, you know, a really cool time to, to be involved in sport. And you know, I think Josh touched on it earlier, but it's an incredibly important thing in our, our world is to, to really enjoy and be passionate about what you are doing because you know, it's, it's not easy. And you, know, you do have to really enjoy the, the journey um, you know, and things don't always go right. So you know, if, if you haven't enjoyed the journey and things don't go right it's, it's a pretty tough time but you know if you've really enjoyed the the process of getting it you to the, that end goal and giving it to you all um then you know regardless of what happens it's uh, been a, a really good time you know I, re I, I wish i'd had heard that speech uh back when i was playing 100 <laughs> years ago because i don't reckon i enjoyed that journey so much but you both brought up the black Ferns before and the big smiles and how they're playing and you can see that they're enjoying the journey that they're on um which is, you know, it's good when you're looking back on your career as well to be able to say it wasn't just about the wins, actually it was about the, the good times leading up to that. Was it an easy decision for you to put 2024 aside? I know this is an unscript and you're looking at me going, what the hell is she going on about now? <laughs> but was it an, is it an easy decision to push Paris 2024 to the side to focus on MCUP? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's a anything's ever an, an easy decision um, you know and obviously really love Olympic mm -hmm. sailing um, you know I think it really is the the pinnacle of um, you know one design dinghy sailing like you like you do when when you grow up as a kid um, and you know we really love the competing but you know the, the time round there are a few too many things over the top of each other you know the America's Cups what a month after the Olympics now and you know we also uh, you know really enjoying racing in Sail GP as well um, which is kind of taking up the, the other half of, of my calendar at the moment. So, you know, I kind of feel like I'm pretty much at capacity between those two things. And, you know, they complement each, each other incredibly well. 
Um, you know, for those of you that don't know much about CellGP, we are very limited on our training time. So essentially you um, have to arrive at a venue you know, a couple of days before you race. So if you looked at the total time we actually spend sailing, we probably spend about half of that time racing. Um, so the, the, the volume's quite low, where the America's Cup's the exact opposite, where we have a race in October 24, but between now and then, it's, it's all training and all developing. Um, so yeah, the, the balance of those two you know, works together incredibly nicely, and you know, I think it's gonna be a real positive for us as a sailing team. Okay, we're gonna get on to the other passion of yours, which is around conservation, uh, and we'll take a quick look at this video, the Live Ocean Foundation. From as early as I can remember, the ocean was uh, part of everyday life. Don't really know which memories were first, uh, you know, of being around the ocean, but I've definitely got a lot of them. Yeah, I think as I've grown up, I've obviously got more and more into sailing, and that's become a very big part of my life. But one thing that hasn't changed is my love of the ocean, and most of my days when I'm not sailing is spent uh, on the ocean or under the ocean. Blair and myself had an awesome mission up north uh, recently. School fish were probably as good as I've seen out in the Bay of Islands. You know, we saw a few dolphins on the way out and you know, they seem to follow us around all day. Blue Mau Mau, Pink Mau Mau, Trevally, lots of kawaii. You don't see it all the time like that, but uh, you certainly appreciate it when you do. Yeah, well maybe I'm slightly skewed, but I definitely think New Zealanders you know, have, a, have a pretty special connection with the ocean. You know. We have got a beautiful country, we've got an amazing amount of coastline and oceans. We're lucky to have, to have what we've got. My worry is that that won't be the case for, for future generations. You know, I don't think people really realise you know, what, what we've got as a country, and, you know, but we really want to be able to look the next generation in the eye and say, you know, we tried, we've taken it on. So that was a foundation that you and Blair started, and I, I don't think we have to ask you about what the motivation was <laughs> for that, but I just wonder how proud you are of that foundation. Yeah, well, it's an interesting one when you use the, the word proud. You know, I feel like we're very much at the start of a journey. You know, we're three years into it now, and we've done a whole of hard work. We feel like we've got a, a lot of, you know, runs on the board, but, you know, it feels like we're only really just getting started. and. You know, just throwing a few stats out there, I threw one before that, you know, 94% of our, our country is ocean. You know, the ocean absorbs 90% of the heat, it generates over half the oxygen we breathe, and it really is that, that life support system for the planet. So for us to kind of continue to thrive like we are now, um, you know, we do need to start looking after it. And, you know, for me, the exciting part is, is that really isn't getting looked after at all. So for New Zealand to have a huge impact on the, the global stage, like we don't have the opportunity really to do that with land just because we don't have that much of it, but we really do have a, a massive opportunity uh, through the ocean. And you know, I think we, we really do need to step up and, and, and make some, some changes. I'm gonna go off script again and <laughs> talk about earlier this year because you attended the UN Ocean Conference, which was in Portugal, you and Blair. You made the decision last minute, from what I understand, after a Sail GP event, to head up to um, that conference. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was, um, for me, it was an uh, incredible time to get up to that, that conference. Uh, um, I've never been to anything like that before. You know, I think it was really interesting for me to see the I suppose things happening at, at all different levels. You know, you have your, your non-for-profits NGOs there all kind of advocating for, for what action that we need to take and you have your governments uh, all trying to, to work through the, the issues they have within their, their certain um, entities. Um, you, have, you, know, you have so many different people pushing a really positive message. And, you know, the thing I really love there was to hear about people's ambition for, for what can actually be done and you know even without getting too off script like like yourself here <laughs> yeah people starting to, to seriously invest in climate resilience just because they see the risks of, of what's happening if we don't do something about it um, you know we you see how, how quickly the weather's changing you know how um, especially to our, our neighbours to the north how, how much it's starting to affect people and, and how big the, the bills are starting to become because of it so now it's a, a pretty incredible um, 
thing to have got to go along to and, and hear people speak and you know for me it's just you know really trying to see New Zealand step up in terms of our ambition as to what we want to see our ocean our, our ocean as. Right, I'm going back to script now because um, I just see uh, we've got photos of the antipode and albatross being put up. So I know that the, that the foundation partners with some incredible people, some scientists, innovators, uh, communicators, a whole bunch, and they're doing some work around this bird. Because what is it at the moment? Serious trouble, right? So talk to us about the foundation and the connection with the Torua. Yeah. So the <laughs> the, the foundation actually our, our first. Um, I suppose, cause we, we got behind. So, so as an organisation, Live Ocean, we partner with um, existing people. You know, we, we really amplify and accelerate existing things that, that are happening and, and amazing projects. And you know, the, the video you're, you're seeing behind me here, um, actually one of the, the speakers earlier today helped, helped us put it together um, with Siri and Taylor in, in the background. And I think that bird there was animated. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, but, you know, when we got behind this, we, we talked to a couple of amazing Kiwi scientists who have been, you know, spending their summers down in the Antipodean Islands for the, the last 20 years. And, you know, it's a bit of a heartbreaking story because, um, you know, they, they went down there for the first five years and the species seemed to be absolutely fine. And, you know, the, the reason we chose this as our, our first um, program to get behind is because it's pretty easy to get an emotional connection with these birds. Um, you know, they've got a, a three metre wingspan. Um, you know, they've got so many traits like um, humans, where they, they pretty much mate with a, a pair for life. Um, you know, they need both of them to, to really be able to raise the, their offspring. And getting slightly sidetracked watching the video, to be honest. But um, yeah, it, it, it's the population's literally long and short in free fall to extinction at the moment. And that's pretty much all due to incidental mortality through surface longlining, through commercial fishing. Um, and yeah, you would have seen before, but you know, these birds have absolutely amazing sense of smell. So they can smell, you know, scraps of food from absolutely miles away, and, and they obviously don't know there's a, a hook attached to that. And the the rate of drowning is incredibly high. And you know, this is one of the the projects for me that is absolutely heartbreaking because it's such an easy one to solve. You know, they have mitigation techniques to do this that we just don't enforce. And you know, it's a a bird that faces no predators on land. They are at a pest-free island, 250 miles southeast of New Zealand in the Antipodes. If no one knows where that is, and you know they're just in this absolutely free fall. And you know we talk about them as a sentinel species. You know they're a species that really is an indicator of you know the health of the ocean. You know and they're absolutely uh, incredible. You know I'm not sure how many people here have been between two bits of land by boat, but you know. They can do a whole heap better job of uh, navigating them than anyone I know without a, a GPS. So it's um, yeah, incredible to see them fly a dead straight line from mm. you know, the Antipodes up to the Chathams uh, and back again. Um, but yeah, you could go any on other questions? About them, can't you? <laughs> um, actually, we've only got about five minutes left, so I'm just I'm mindful that there might be some questions coming uh, from the floor, but uh, nobody's put their hand up yet. So let's talk about uh, Sail GP coming to Christchurch next year. In fact, congratulations, sold out um, within the first 24 hours, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, it's, um, <laughs> I suppose one of those bit of, bit of an up and down story for us on, on this. Uh, we're obviously gutted not to be able to bring in events in New Zealand last year. Um, obviously, first one got cancelled due to COVID, but you know, absolutely stoked to, to finally have one, <laughs> knowing it's, what, five months away now is uh, very exciting. and. You know, the thing for me that has been very exciting about Sail GP is being able to use that power of sport, that, that platform to, to really amplify a, a bigger message. And you know, right since the inception of our team, you know, we wanted Live Ocean to be a massive part of that. And then you know, since then, the, the whole league's actually got on board and every team uh, now has to do the same thing where they have to have a charity partner. We have a thing called the Impact League, which is really the, the race within the race and is every team getting audited on you know so many different categories in terms of you know their sustainability and, and inclusion uh, mainly so you, know, you get broken down in terms of you know exactly how much fuel you're using you know what your carbon footprint is um, you know, how many people you're affecting throughout 
uh, the competition and you actually get scored on that as well. So, you know, it's the, the first podium for the planet and, you know, as a team, um, you know, New Zealand's LGP team was pretty excited to, to win the, the inaugural season in that. So it's two podiums, right? One for sailing. <clears throat> Yeah. And then the other one is for uh, the impact, basically, or yep. lack of, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, well, we call it impact because you also do a, a lot of positive things, um, mm. you know, whether it's giving people opportunities. Um, there's a Inspire program where essentially you um, give people internships uh, at the venues. So, yeah, it's. I suppose you're a lack of impact in the, the environmental sense, but then also the impact you have um, outside of that through your voice. Can I, just one more question around uh, Sail GP here in Christchurch. Um, I know that there are a number of things that have been planned to leave as a legacy here in Christchurch. I wonder whether you can share anything of those <laughs> with us. Um, yeah, well, still the, the final planning's still ongoing in a lot of ways, but yeah, I think that's a, uh, incredibly exciting thing about having these sporting events and you know I think yeah, we've talked about you know, that, that legacy that the Cups left um, post uh, having their event in Auckland and you know that makes us incredibly excited about what we can achieve and what we can leave for the long term um, you know down here in, in Christchurch um, you know we've got some pretty incredible things underway um, you know building on from from what Yachting New Zealand's doing with the, the Manawana Moana program um, and yeah, it's uh, going to be a pretty special event. You know, it's um, yeah, we're looking forward to it. Um, I'm going, this is my final question. I don't know, again, if there's uh, any questions from the floor. And I guess this has been somewhat contentious um, over the last little while within sport itself. But I, I want to get it quite specific for the two of you around the role that sport plays in tackling some of the big issues. Um, of our time, and I wonder whether you have any recommendations, suggestions for organisations uh, that want to use their platform for good, I guess, in a sense, in what you both are doing? Yeah, well, I could probably kick off. <laughs> yeah, well, I suppose the beautiful thing about sport, when we broke it down and did, did a lot of research um, in the early days of this whole competition and actually saw it firsthand through the Ocean Race, where one of the teams ran a, a massive campaign. It was. Um, very plastic focused on that one but called turn the tide on plastic and you know just the amount of traction you can get um, and connecting to a, a massive audience issues that, that they don't normally get connected to um, so yeah for us that's the incredibly exciting thing about you know having an environmental climate message woven into sport is you get all the normal benefits of sport of people being active of having connections of you know people enjoying and, and the community building side, but then you also have that, that caring for the environment and, and the long-term piece, um, you know, woven on top of that. So, you know, for us to be able to promote the messages of a you know, healthy ocean for a healthy planet, um, you know, as part of a team where we're you know, essentially racing on that ocean um, and to the, a, a vastly different audience to, to people that we normally reach. You know, for me, the thing that always blows me away is, you know, if you start talking a, f a few stats uh, about the ocean or about the environment, you know, how little knowledge there is out there. And, you know, my challenge to everyone here would be to, to find something that they're passionate about and to, to learn a, bit, a little bit more about it. Um, you know, I think Josh has talked about it and I've definitely talked about it, but we're very much early days on this journey. You know, we feel like we've got so much to learn. Um, you know, there's so many amazing scientists and, and people in the community and in this country that are doing absolutely amazing things with, um, you know, off the smell of an oily rag with very little recognition. So, you know, that's mainly been our goal to, to get behind them and to, to really amplify the, the amazing things that, that are going on, but, you know, also to, to get as many people to, to really dive into the, the detail of the issues we actually do face. Brilliant. Josh? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I have to add to that is it, it is a journey, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a long-term project and there's a lot to be done and Pete and Blair are quite a long way down that. I don't think they're that far near the start. They've put a hell of a lot of work in and, you know, I'm about halfway or a quarter and I'm just slowly trying to keep up and keep learning. I think that's what everyone needs to keep doing is keep moving in the right direction and keep learning and, and keep supporting the good initiatives and, and pushing out good messages that are in your area. 
Tēnā kōrua. I'm going to invite Raylene up to the stage uh, just to thank you both, but from my perspective, um, facilitating this conversation, thank you both so much. Absolute privilege um, to sit here and throw some unscripted questions <laughs> at you both. Thank Love you. Love it in my, in my happy space.